Listen, we're going to have a great day, and today we're going to continue in our sermon series where we are looking at the lingering effect of the last words of Jesus that he spoke to us from the cross upon which he paid the price for your sin and mine. And today I want to ask you two questions, two questions. Question number one is what, in in your life right now, okay, what do you, they're rhetorical, so don't shout out your answer. In, In your life right now, What do you need the most in your life right now? What do you need the most? Question number one, what do you need the most? Question number two, in your life right now, what do you want the most? Ooh, big questions, right? Really make you think for a second. What do you need most? What do you want most? Now, what would you say if I told you, not knowing every detail of your life, that I already know the answer to both of those questions for you? Huh? Would you believe me? What if I told you that the answer to both of those questions is the same answer? See, today as we explore the last words of Jesus, what I believe you'll see is that the last words of Jesus that both expose your greatest need and reveal your deepest desire, and that is your great need for and your deep desire of forgiveness, forgiveness. Today we're going to talk about the real F word, the forgiveness word, and to do so, we're going to look at the last words of Jesus from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to to that book, uh, that chapter, and that verse. If you don't, it's just one of them today, so you can read it on the screen. At this point in Luke's Gospel, we find Jesus hanging on his cross. Uh, A lot of very important miracles have been performed. A lot of very world-changing sermons have been preached. Uh, There's been a lot of amazing relationships that have been built, bonds that have been formed, lives that have been changed. Jesus rides into Jerusalem um, five days before this day on a donkey that he borrowed from somebody, and all the people are so glad that he's there. That was on a Sunday, and here we are on a Friday, and Jesus has gone from being hailed as the King and the Messiah to now hanging on a cross, dying a criminal's death. This didn't just happen overnight. It, it, well, it kind of did, but it wasn't just a, a one-and-done sort of thing. He was uh, arrested for nothing, uh, accused of crimes that he didn't commit, things that aren't actually crimes. He was tried, found guilty, sentenced to death. He was beaten, he's bloodied, he's bruised. He's experiencing incredible physical pain, words we don't have enough of to describe. In fact, from his, his, the, the place where he was beaten to the place that he was crucified, the, the Roman soldiers made him carry his own cross up a hill to a place called Golgotha. The word Golgotha means the place of the skull. Sounds scary? This, it is scary, right? The the weight of that cross was so heavy, Luke tells us, that Jesus crumbled under the weight of that cross. And and, and the Roman guards had to call a man from northern Africa out of the crowd named Simon to carry Jesus' cross for him the rest of the way up that hill. And so here you have Jesus hanging on a cross, experiencing physical suffering that we don't have words to describe. It's experiencing an emotional separation that, that no one had and no one has since experienced, where, where Jesus is literally separated from the love of God his Father and the goodness of God his Father. And in this same moment, as if the physical suffering wasn't enough, the emotional separation wasn't enough, not only is Jesus bearing the physical weight of his body on that cross, he's also bearing the full weight of the full wrath of God for both your sins and mine. And from this place, Jesus says these last words in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, if you're a human like me, with even the tiniest shred of a need for justice, and for things that are wrong to be made right. You read these words and you're like, no, 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 Jesus, you didn't say that right. You meant to say, Father, for smite them. Oh, nobody wants to be honest in the house of God during the 1015 service? 
Father, for punch them. Father, for drop kick them in the jugular. Father, for exterminate them. That's what you meant to say, Jesus, right? Not Father, forgive them. Listen, Jesus did something that you and I would like to think that we could do, but if we're being honest, there's no way in the world, in this context, from this place, experiencing these things, that we'd be able to say what Jesus said. But Jesus being fully human, just like you and me, and fully divine from his cross, says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. The last words of Jesus expose, excuse me, the last words of Jesus, yeah, expose your greatest need and reveal your deepest desire. And that's for forgiveness. And so what do these words mean? As Jesus is hanging there and as Jesus says these words, what is he actually saying? He says, Father, forgive them. As Jesus says, Father, forgive them, the first thing that we see is that sin is exposed. When Jesus says, Father, forgive them, the implication is that there is something that needs to be forgiven. And what needed to be forgiven was sin. And he says, Father, forgive them, them, them. Who is them? Who are the them that needs forgiveness? Well, let's see who was there. There were Roman soldiers that were there. These guys were trained executioners. This was their job. They were there by order, not by choice. For the Roman soldiers who were there, this was just another Friday at the office. This is what they were doing. It's what they knew how to do. There were a lot of Jewish people there that day that Jesus said these last words in front of. There were the religious leaders of the community, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all these, these different groups. And, and this was what they had worked towards. This is what they wanted. They didn't like Jesus from the drop, and they spent their entire time, energy, and effort to get to this exact moment, this exact place, with this exact outcome. The disciples of Jesus were there, although by this point they had deserted him. They had fled in every different direction that they could go, and they were probably hiding under a hood somewhere off in the crowd watching Jesus experience what Jesus was experiencing. Jesus' family was there. His friends were there. I mean, imagine your brother, your neighbor, your son watching him experience what he's experiencing. These are the, the them who was there. And I know what you're thinking. Well, well thank God. I wasn't there. He's not talking about me. Father, forgive them. I'm not them. Actually, you are them. I am them. We weren't there in the gallery watching him die, but we were there on his shoulders as he bore the weight of the full wrath of God, the weight of sin, the sin of humanity, including yours and including mine. My friend, you are them. You are them. So am I. Jesus says, Father, forgive them, exposing sin and our need for forgiveness from it. But he also said they don't know what they're doing. And when he said they don't know what they're doing, what he did was he was expressing his empathy. He was saying, God, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. None of the them, none of the they who were there knew the magnitude of what was going on. The Roman soldiers were just doing their job. This was a criminal from all, all that they knew. The, 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 the governor had said, crucify him. They were doing what they were ordered to do. They didn't know what they were doing. In fact, after Jesus died, the Bible records that one of these soldiers actually looked and said, surely this was a righteous man. He didn't realize it until after the deed was done. The soldiers didn't know. The religious leaders of the community, in all honesty, they should have known because what they were witnessing, what they had done, and what they had produced, the outcome that they had produced, had been prophesied throughout the entirety of the Old Testament, the scripture that they clung so tightly to, they didn't even realize that this had to happen. They didn't know. Jesus' family and friends didn't know. And you and I, listen, we didn't know what we were doing either. There was a time in your life where you were doing things that were wrong. And in case you were um, uh, confused as to when that time in your life was, it's right now. Right now. Now, there was a time in your life where you were doing things that were wrong, and you knew they were wrong because you know the difference between right and wrong. And people are like, oh, I didn't know. Liar. Yes, you did. Everybody knows. 
But there was a time in your life where you were doing things that were wrong, but you did not know that that was a part of the weight that Christ bore on that cross. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5 that, that, that Christ showed his love for us and that while you and I were still sinning, that Christ hung on that cross and died. We didn't know. And Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He's showing his empathy to us. Not only our need for forgiveness, but the fact that he still cares about us when it was our fault. When we were at we were at fault. The last words of Jesus, it, it exposes your greatest need and it reveals your deepest desire. So what is your greatest need? What is your deepest desire? It is forgiveness. It's forgiveness. Two questions, one answer. It's forgiveness. You need the, the, the vertical forgiveness that only comes heaven down. The forgiveness that Christ was giving you and offering you as he hung on that cross, as he was put in that borrowed grave, grave and as he rose again on that third day. Listen, I know Easter's right around the corner. That does not count as Easter Sunday. You still have to come on Easter, okay? But that's the forgiveness that we're talking about. Vertical forgiveness. It's important forgiveness. That's game-changing kind of forgiveness. That forgiveness is the difference between who you are and who you are becoming. And you'll have an opportunity to receive the forgiveness from your sins before you go home today. Doesn't come from me. Doesn't even come from Pastor Crystal. It comes from heaven down, from God's heart right to you. That's vertical forgiveness. And if we're being honest, which I hope you are, we don't have any issue with horizontal forgiveness. Excuse me, vertical forgiveness. Talking in front of people is hard sometimes. <laughs> we're okay with the vertical forgiveness. Yes, God, forgive me of my sins. Yes, God, pour out your empathy and your grace on me, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's not the vertical forgiveness that's our struggle. It's the horizontal forgiveness that we take issue with. It's the forgiveness that we need to give others, but even more than that, it's the forgiveness that we need to seek from others. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The last words that Jesus speaks expose your greatest need, and they reveal your deepest desire. Jesus actually said this about, about forgiveness in Matthew chapter 6. He said, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. See, there's more on the line when it comes to forgiveness than I think we like to talk about. There's more on the, on the table when we, when we talk about forgiveness than what we really want to recognize, what we want to acknowledge. And so today, what I want to do is I want to help you see the forgiveness that you need to give and also the forgiveness that you need to seek. And to do that, I'm going to need some help. Whitaker, will you come help me real quick? Hop up here, Whit. This is my, uh, we'll call him 17. This is my 17-year-old Whit. Uh, he's a good guy. He's going to help us out. And I wonder, in your life, in your world, does it ever feel like there's a target on your back? Anybody ever feel like that? Yeah. Whitaker, you missed the timing. That would have been perfect. <laughs> you ever feel like there's a target on your back? Lester, grab this for me. You feel like you're walking around, doing your thing, minding your own business, just your daily sort of stuff, and you're walking around, and there's a target on your back. Y'all ever feel like that? Come back over here. With. Okay. Like, it's not, like, what am I doing? I'm just, mind, I'm just living my life. I'm just doing my own thing. And people constantly coming at me. You got to turn this way, dude. We practice this. Come on. Oh, golly. But here, yeah, that's okay. Y'all can clap for dubs. And as you just mind in your own business, it's like people just start coming at you. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Let me, let me see. All the moms in here are like, oh, no, he is not. <laughs> Safety first, ladies and gentlemen. Put it on. I told him that he gave me his permission to do this earlier, and it's okay. Listen, listen, listen. You wake up, you go to work, minding your own business, sitting in traffic, 
and somebody in the state car of New Hampshire cuts you off, flips you off because it's your fault that you were there? Y'all know the state car of New Hampshire, Subaru Outlook. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You show up at work, and Suzanne in HR, y'all know Suzanne, she drops by and she like passively, aggressively, hey, can you check, change the ink toner? If it runs out when you print something, can you just change it? It would make it so much better for the rest of us. Okay, Suzanne, I got it. Maybe you order Chipotle for lunch, chippers, that's what the youth call it, chippers. You ask for guac. And guac is extra. It's $19 extra. (laughs) They forget your guac. Uh, Excuse me, I ordered guac on this. I don't see any guac. Okay, just chill out, all right? We'll get you some guac. It's not the end of the world. Whoa. It's like you got a target on your back, and you're not doing anything wrong. Y'all are nervous that I'm going to miss, aren't you? I'm really good at stuff that doesn't matter. (laughs) I could and will be on the cover of Obscure Sports Quarterly before I'm dead. ESPN 8, the Ocho, have you ever heard of it? (laughs) Stuff like this, stuff like that, it's more annoying than it is painful. But what about what about the, the stuff that really hurts? Like on, on your way home, boss calls you in to the office and says, hey, listen, we're making some changes with the business. You're not going to get as many hours as you've been getting. And that's that. Like it impacts your livelihood. Food on your table, sort of. You get that call from your spouse, your significant other, whoever it is, and they say, hey, listen, uh, this is over. It's not me, it's you, and I don't want to work on it. That was close. (laughs) Well, Pastor Tyler, you don't live a real life in the real world. I did that on purpose, relax. (laughs) You're a pastor. You only work one day a week. Like, what could you possibly know about what you're preaching right now? I know more than you think. I've gotten a lot of ugly emails. People have said a lot of nasty things. They have accused me of being spiritually abusive. I've been accused of being a white nationalist. They say things about my wife. They say things about my family. And they say things about my ministry. But how could you possibly know what it feels like to have a target on your back, Pastor Tyler? Isn't that what it feels like sometimes? I agree. I agree this can be reality, but but this is not the only part of the reality I want you to see today. Because what happens is, is that when you are here, the only thing that you can think about is the target on your back and the darts that have been thrown at you. You become completely consumed with this. And if it's not this one, it's this one. And then from this one, you move over here to that one. And then I'll never forget when Suzanne got on me about that toner and the ink in the printer. Okay? You become comp- so consumed with the darts that are in your own back that a lot of times you fail to remember that the people throwing the darts at you, they've got not darts in their back, but they've got arrows in their back. Let's put it up here. I want y'all to see this. Isn't it so easy to forget that it can always be worse? 
that when you don't know what you don't know, you can become so laser focused on the darts that are in your back that you fail to remember the arrows coming out of someone else's? You ever heard the expression that hurt people hurt people? It's true. I'd even, I'd even tweak that a little bit to say targeted people target people. I'd even go as, as far to point out that a lot of times you're me. And you're not just taking the darts, you're throwing them. No look. What do you do? What do you do? A lot of times, a lot of times, a lot of times, not a lot of times, all the time, you got to forgive the darts that you feel knowing full well that there are arrows you don't see. you got to forgive the darts that you feel knowing full well that you've thrown more than your fair share of darts at other people too. The way that you forgive others and seek forgiveness from others is directly correlated to the forgiveness that Christ extends to you. That's what Matthew chapter 6 told us. We've got we to focus on forgiveness. And if Jesus hanging on a cross, experiencing all that he was experiencing, you want to talk about arrows, hello. If he can say from that cross, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. How much more quickly should we be able to say, I ah, forgive them. They got their own stuff going on. You guys, you guys follow me? And so what I want to do before we get you out of here today is I want to I help you. I don't just want to paint a picture for you. That one's heavy, so I had to sit down to do it. I want to paint a picture for you of what this type of forgiveness looks like. And because um, I like uh, alliterative things, I've got what I call 4D forgiveness, 4D forgiveness. There's, uh, you know, 2D, 3D, and there's 4D. That's a whole nother, a whole nother level of D. Come on, somebody, are you with me? It's like Pixar D. This is where we're going. Like, this is next level dimensions right here. First D of 4D forgiveness is that you have to decide for it. You have to decide for forgiveness. What am I saying? You have to take the target off your back. Okay? You can take your helmet off, buddy. Any handsome? People. People say he looks just like me, too. See? You got to decide, take that target off your back. I'm not saying it doesn't feel like that. I'm not saying those feelings aren't real, but I am saying no one's making you walk around with it. There's no rule that says you have to hold on to it. Make a decision for forgiveness. The Apostle Paul said in a letter to a church he wrote in a town called Ephesus, he says, uh, decide, he says don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't let the, don't let the devil take a foothold. He's saying you have a choice. He's not saying it's wrong to be angry. It's not, not saying it's wrong to feel hurt. It's, he's not saying it's wrong to acknowledge the hurt. He's just saying, make the choice. Don't take it with you. And he says, don't let the devil take a foothold. Why? Because if you give the devil a foothold, he'll make it a stronghold. And when the devil makes a stronghold, he's in a position to put you in a chokehold. You ready to tap out? Because I'm not really choking you, right? It's hard to tell on camera. The life that you want, the life that you deserve, the life that Christ died so that you can have, by deciding to keep the target on your back, you're allowing the devil to choke that life right out of you. You've got to decide for forgiveness. Second D, you have to depend on God for forgetness. It's not a word. Don't look it up, but I hope you remember it. You've got to decide for forgiveness. You've got to depend on God for forgetness. Forgetness. 
The Apostle Paul wrote a letter to a church in a town called Rome, and he says, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, he says, live at peace. Don't seek revenge. Check it out. Wait. He says, leave the wrath to God. I love that. I don't know why. Maybe it's because I'm too human. But I love, listen, I love knowing that I can depend on God to take care of what I can't take care of. I know that I can depend on God to make right what others have made wrong. And I also know that others can depend on God to make right what I've made wrong too. Are you with me? You've got to depend on God for forgiveness. Forgiveness, it can be challenging, but we can get there. It's the forgiveness that's the tough part. I heard someone say this about forgive and forget. It's probably the best thing maybe I've ever heard on forgiveness, and I say it all the time. It's not just forgive and forget. It's forgive and forget again. And you want to know what forgetness looks like? You just, you just start taking them out. That one time that one person said this. That one time my mom commented on my parenting skills. That one time my sister pushed me off my bike. That happened a couple times for me. <laughs> that one time somebody was mean at work. That one time I got passed over for a promotion. That one time my boss yeah, said what they said. That one time that spouse said those things. At one time, I can't even talk about that time. That one time, I literally gave my life to those people, and they accused me of all those things that I wasn't. That one time, and that one time, and that one time. Are you guys getting the picture here? That one time, and that one time, that one time. Boom. Depend on God. Only God can give you faith to do that. Take the target off your back. Take the darts. Take the darts off too. Forget. And if you can get to that place, the third D is this. You've got to disengage with your emotions. Whew. Emotions, check this out. Emotions want to take you back to a place that faith has saved you from. I didn't write that down anywhere. That just came straight from heaven. Are you listening to me? You're emotional people. And your feelings are fake. The Bible says that they are deceptive above all things. I'm not saying they're not real. I'm not saying you don't need to work through them. I'm just saying you can't rely on them. You gotta disengage with those feelings. You gotta disengage with those emotions. If you ever find yourself in a place where you say, hey, listen. I can work on the forgiveness, I can work on the forgiveness, but I just can't forgive them for that one thing. It was too much. It was too mean, and they've never apologized. If you find yourself in a place where you're saying, I feel like I can't forgive, that is the most clear indicator that that's the exact thing that you need to forgive. Disengage with the emotions. Disengage. And the fourth D is you've got to deliver it to God. Deliver it to God. Can I ask you a question? I'm a common sense guy. I don't know if y'all have picked, picked that up about me yet. I'm just common sense. And if, you're, if you have done the work, listen to me, if you've done the work of taking off this target, of pulling out all these hurts and all these pains and all these stings, and you're being proactive and intentional and monitoring the emotional side of it as well. If you've done all that work, I did it in 30 seconds. This may take three months. This may take three years. Some of you may be holding on to a dart that's 30 years old. Somebody some said something when you were a kid. If you don't go to seminary, Tyler, you're only ever going to be a country preacher. That hurt. If you don't do this the way that you're supposed to do it, how could you leave me? When are you coming back home? 
Why are you going to do that kind of work? Hopefully at the guidance of a professional who can help you. Why are you going to do all that kind of work and still hold on to the hurt? Why? My hands are locked in here. I can't do anything. That's why you got to deliver it to God. You want to know what delivering it to God looks like? You watching? When we say lay it down at his feet, that's what that looks like. Lay it down, deliver it to God. God, I don't want this anymore. Could you take it? You know what his answer is? Yep, got it. God, I'm tired of holding these these sharp, painful memories. Can you help me with that? Yep, absolutely I can. Let the memorial of your past hurts be a reminder of God's present grace. Are you with me, church? And the last words that Jesus says, let him expose your need for forgiveness in a way that you might not have ever seen it before. And let them reveal your deepest desire, your desire to receive forgiveness from others and hopefully your desire to deliver forgiveness to others as well. Today, before you go, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to practice what I have preached. Really all of us, but you specifically. And you're probably thinking, I wasn't expecting a test. I wasn't expecting a pop quiz. This is less of a pop quiz and it's more of a, I hope it's a life-changing exercise for you. If you look in the pocket of the seat in front of you, there's a, there's a little card. Uh, Mr. Roger, hand me one of those, please. And I'll take a pen too, because I'm going to participate with everybody. So it looks like this, last words. It's the, in the pockets of the seat in front of you. I want everybody. I'm, I'm Everybody, it's not for just the people in the front row. It's for everybody. Get it out, get it out, get it out, get it out. I preached extra fast today to make sure I had extra time so that we could do this exercise together, okay? Blessed are the short-winded, for they get to do cards at the end of service. All right, here we go. Here we go. Break it out. Break it out. Last words. What we're going to do is, is, is before the band plays and before the band ministers to us and before the band leads us, I want you to take this card, turn it over on the backside, and you'll notice that there's two columns. Uh, the first one says, I need to forgive. And what I want you to do is I want you to write down the names, if you're, if you're feeling bold, and at, at least the initials of people that have thrown those darts at you, that you need to let them go, deliver it to God. I want you to write their initials. And not yet. We're going to do it together. We're going to work together. Uh, Let me just tell you, I've done this once before. I did this a couple of times this week in my own heart. This side of the page, that's the easy side. You're going to run out of blanks. Okay? But then when you go to the other side, the I need forgiveness from side, that's the hard one to fill out. We're really, 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 really good and really, really, really open to identifying the people that owe us an apology and remain selectively ignorant to the people that deserve one from us. This is important work right here. The work that you do on the back of this card today Matthew chapter 6 says is directly connected to the forgiveness that you receive from God above. So I'm going to pray. Brentley's going to sing. I'm going to fill mine out. And then at some point when you're ready, when you've filled out your names, when you've filled out your card, here's what I want you to do. I want you to tear it in half. This is on purpose. You're not wasting it. This is good. And you're going to take the side of I need to forgive and you're going to deliver it to God. I want you to get out of your seat. I want you to walk here to the front of this room and I want you to drop it in this basket. Literally, physically deliver it to God. Lay it down at his feet. And then the other half of this card, don't leave that one here. Put it in your pocket and take it home. Put it in your Bible. Stick it in your purse. Uh, put it on the, in the little dash of your car like a, in front of the RPMs because nobody ever, it doesn't matter. The RPMs are there, it's useless. Why do we put that there? Put it in there so you can see. Let it be a reminder of who you need to seek forgiveness from and don't you dare remove
remove it until you have gone and, and sought that forgiveness. Are you with me? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Let's be intentional about knowing what we're doing. And let's do it this morning. Amen.